Well, good morning. Uh, we're on Facebook Live. We're in a new territory uh, this morning uh, with everything going on with the coronavirus. And we could be in this territory for uh, several weeks or months. We're really not sure. Uh, but we're continu going to continue to do church. Uh, we're not sure in what format it will be. We'll, we could continue this. And uh, for a while, we'll, do the, uh, we'll mirror the services that we always do. So we'll do our 608 service. And then we'll do this 915 and then 1045. And um, I want to encourage you that uh, you can't come to church now. Uh, you can go to church, I guess, but you'll be doing it in the privacy of your own home. And, uh, you know, think about inviting family and friends maybe that won't walk into a church. Maybe they come over to your house and, and, and watch the, uh, the services or whatever. But uh, we'll see what happens with this. I also want to tell you that uh, however good or bad this is this week, we're going to get better. Uh, we tried this last night just to kind of uh, get things going, to experiment with it. So what you see today will only get better. Uh, we'll have to buy some new equip equipment possibly and things like that. And I want to thank all of those that were here uh, late last night and early this morning that came in to help get this going. And uh, we'll just see what happens uh, with this. So I want to thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, before we start the message, I just want to talk about a few other things. And uh, first is this. We, we're in uncertain times right now. Uh, both as a church and as a nation and as a world, we're really in uncharted uh, waters. And uh, there's going to be a new normal that's going to emerge out of this. And uh, I know my grandfather, I was very close to him, my grandpa Steinke, he died many years ago, but he had lived through World War I. He had lived through World War II. He had lived through the Great uh, Depression. And I think that really in many ways made him the person who he was. And, uh, you know, as Americans lately, we've been blessed that we haven't had to deal with anything like this, I guess, 9-11 uh, was the last uh, type of uh, uh, national uh, uh, challenge that we've had. So uh, we're going to get through this. There will be an other side of this. And the uh, truth of the matter is, is we need Jesus. Uh, we need Jesus more than ever. Uh, like I said, we're going to do, uh, be doing this Facebook Live. And I, I mentioned this last night that uh, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, know this, that the, uh, the camera adds five pounds to your frame. So I am not this heavy, I'm five pounds lighter. So uh, keep that in mind. And uh, I guess it probably wouldn't be a quest if I didn't uh, do an apology. And I haven't done any apologies in two months. But uh, I did this last night, and I, I'm really sorry I can't do this in person with people here. But I just want to publicly apologize to our worship leader, uh, Tom Bender. I used some harsh words uh, that I shouldn't have said in a very harsh tone with him. We had a meeting a while back, and we met uh, about this, and I talked to him and apologized to him and to Dee Dee. Uh, so going forward, I just, uh, I just want to say I'm sorry to him. And um, for me, it's frustrating because I'm, I'm making great strides as I continue to walk with Christ, but I still stumble sometimes, and I did. And I've said before, this is an imperfect church led by an imperfect uh, pastor, uh, but my prayer is that this imperfect pastor would continue to grow and um, never be perfect, but be less imperfect uh, than he is today. So we're going to pray, and uh, I'll just the uh, same message that we did last night. We did have services last night, but some things had happened during the day, and we met uh, last night. A couple board members uh, were here, and then we spoke to all the board members, and uh, we decided it would, it would be best if we didn't hold um, services. Uh, one of the reasons is we had some people um, that we thought probably shouldn't have been here last night that came, and uh, some people that we thought were older and had compromised medical situations. I, we think they were planning on coming this morning as well, and uh, sometimes, I, I'm, it's true about me too, sometimes we need to uh, protect people from themselves, and uh, we did this just, we thought it was the best decision, and uh, hopefully it, it was the right one as we've chosen to cancel services. Well, let me pray, and we'll begin with the message this morning. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this time. I, I thank you that we have technology that we can still uh, reach out to people uh, in this place, uh, Father, even use this. Uh, this is not what we intended to do this morning, but even use this, uh, what we have to do now. Uh, use this to glorify your name uh, so that your name would be better known, uh, not only in our community, but on our world as well. And we play, pray this in your name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're uh, continuing on our sermon series about Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament, and we're already on week five. And today we're going to talk about peril. And really, the peril that we're talking about, it, it's going to deal with fear. And uh, I was uh, scheduled to preach this sermon on fear about Elijah probably about two and a half months ago. So uh, how ironic it is that the 
I think the time that we need to talk about fear, I was planning on, on talking about that anyway today. Uh, so if you're at home, if you want to open up your Bibles and follow along with me, uh, we're going to be, and we've been in 1 Kings for a while, we're going to be in 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 19, uh, verses 1 through 18. And I begin there. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. We know Elijah is the, the prophet of God. He's a good person. God is using him. And we know that Ahab is one of the most evil kings that has ever existed. And Jezebel was one of the most evil queens. And what had Elijah done? Well, if you were here last week, if you weren't, we'll just kind of uh, recap things. Elijah has, has had a showdown on Mount, Mount Carmel facing 400 evil, wicked prophets of Baal. And they were, they were going to, the challenge was to see if the Baal was the real God or the God in heaven is the real God. And they called their God, Baal, to do things, and he didn't. And then Elijah called God to show up in a powerful way, and God did. He burned up the offering that was there, sent fire down from heaven, and all the people started proclaiming, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. So now they realize that the Baals are false gods, but the Lord is the actual God. That's good news. Well, after that, then Elijah has the, the people go after these evil prophets, and the people kill the 450 prophets. We hear that and think, oh my, that sounds kind of harsh. But these prophets were totally corrupt and evil, and these were the same prophets who were encouraging uh, parents to sacrifice their children to the god Baal. So we know how bad they were, and now judgment is upon them, and now these 450 prophets are, are slaughtered by the people. So after this, uh, Elijah goes to Ahab, the evil king, and he says, how now you can eat and drink, because obviously Ahab had been uh, fasting, and they were in the third year without ra uh, rain. Elijah had prophesied that it wasn't going to rain for three years, but now Elijah says, hey, you can quit fasting and go eat and drink because rain is coming. And then he tells Ahab this. He says, hey, get in your chariot and go back to your town of Jezreel, which is about, about 17 miles away. You need to go because rain is coming. And as Ahab is going to pass through that area, it would have been through these areas that had dried up creek beds. And once it starts raining, those creek beds would have become full. The chariot couldn't have made it through there. So Elijah says to Ahab, still thinking there's hope for Ahab, you need to leave now with your chariot and go back to Jezreel. So uh, Ahab does this, and we're told that uh, Elijah runs ahead of him. We're told he tucks his cloak in his belt, he's getting ready to take off, and he actually runs ahead of him for 17 miles. And now they're getting back to the town of Jezreel, and that's when Ahab tells Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. And now we see already that uh, Ahab hasn't changed because he's saying to his wicked wife and queen Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Elijah was only working for God. It's what God had done. But Ahab is refusing to give God the credit, and he's just giving it to the prophet Elijah. So uh, Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Jezebel now says to Elijah basically this, you're a dead man. You're a dead man. Within a day, you're going to be killed. And if we look at this carefully, Jezebel, if she really wanted Elijah dead, I, I think in many ways she probably fears Elijah and kind of fears the holy God, the real God that exists. Because if Jezebel would have wanted to, she could have simply uh, sent an assassin to kill Elijah. Why would you say you're going to be killed tomorrow? Why not just kill Elijah? Jezebel doesn't do that. I think she wants Elijah out of the picture, but she's afraid to actually try to kill him because deep down inside, she knows that uh, this power that, uh, is, uh, that exists for Elijah is a real power. It's the power of God. So she basically threatens to kill him. Well, here it is. Elijah's just defeated 450 prophets of Baal. He's run 17 miles ahead of the chariot that uh, Ahab was driving. He's got this power. God's on his side, and he knows this. 
And then we hear this, and this is kind of a shocker. In verse 3, Elijah was afraid. What? Elijah was, was afraid. It doesn't mean, seem to make sense, but oftentimes the devil, the evil one, attacks after a great victory, and this happens to Elijah. Because even though, even though Elijah had seen the power of God work on Mount Carmel when God had showed up in a powerful way, now he's fear, filled with fear. And where does the fear come from? Well, it, it just kind of doesn't make sense, does it? And uh, uh, Deborah Cody says this. Uh, she says, fear is not a physical thing. It can't force you to do anything. Fear only exists in the emotional realm. You are not a slave to your emotions. But here, Elijah becomes a slave to emotions, and he fears. So we're going to be talking about fear. And fear does strange things to us. And in the times that we live today, this is a time of fear in the world and our country. But what we want, I want to look at some of the things that fear does to us, but it doesn't have to do these things. So first of all, fear causes us fight or flight, doesn't it? It causes fight or flight. And often it's like uh, it's an unrealistic fight or an unrealistic flight. We do things that we really don't have to do, like buying four cases of toilet paper, right? But, but that's what fear has done to us today. And uh, I remember when I was uh, 18 years old, I went to Miami University. Uh, a friend of mine that had graduated a year ahead of me played rugby on the rugby team, talked to me about it. So I came out for the rugby team the first week of classes. In fact, I was one of the first freshmen that came out for the rugby team. And we practiced uh, three weeks. We had two practices a week. We practiced a six, about six times. And somehow, some way, uh, the, the Miami rugby team had an A team, which was like the varsity main team, and then they had a B team, a C team, and a D team. And I had made the B team, and I was one of the most, I was the most inexperienced player on the B team. But uh, I was playing it, I was looking, I didn't know it, a lot about it, but we were uh, going to travel for our first game, and I'll never forget, we were going to play the West Indy Reds. The West Indy Reds. And I thought, okay, that's probably a community college. Everybody there will be my age, maybe a year old or a two-year school. I'd never heard of West Indy before. I figured, again, it was a small community college in, uh, in Indianapolis. Well, we made that trip from uh, Oxford, Ohio, uh, to Indianapolis, and we got there, and I could tell uh, where the rugby pitch was because the giant goalposts that are taller were there, and it was scattered in the middle of soccer fields. And we got there, and a couple police cars pulled on us, and I could tell they weren't there on official business because the, uh, the guys started to get out of the police car, and they were in their 20s, some of them in their 30s, uh, and they got out of their police cars, and they were wearing rugby uniforms. And I saw this, and I asked one of the other players next to me who had played before, I said, well, what, who are these guys? And he says, oh, they're the West Indy Reds. We were actually going to play a men's team. And here I was, 18 years old. A few months ago, I was sitting in high school math class, and all of a sudden, I'm going to play against these guys that had these big mustaches, and you know, a lot of these, these police officers were really buff. And I thought, what have I gotten myself into? It was time for fight or flight. And I couldn't fly, away. I couldn't get away because I hadn't driven. So I played the game, and I remember just how just intense I was and made it through the game, and it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, but if I could have, I might have run away. I don't know, but we have that condition, don't we? And so many times, so many times I look back in my life that maybe I've, I've run away from, from battles that I could have won, that God had already won for me. So that's how we're programmed, fight or flight. Elijah should have fought, but he didn't. He ran away. So we move on, and we're told in the very next verse, when he came to Beersheba in Judah. Now, Elijah is in the northern kingdom in Israel. He goes all the way through the northern kingdom south to the different kingdom of, by this time, uh, the nation of Israel had split in, in half. You see, you had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. He goes to the southern kingdom as far as he can get away from, uh, from Jezebel. And, and, and he gets away from her to an area you think it would be safe. And what's Elijah doing here? And it's the same thing we do oftentimes when we have fears. He's isolating himself. He's putting himself in isolation. And now with this uh, virus stuff going on, sometimes isolation is a good thing. But a isolation is never a bad thing 
when we're trying to go away from our fears. So uh, uh, Elijah is isolating himself. And I'm going to tell another story happened to me again when I was young and I was in college. And I got this job uh, helping to paint houses to help pay for my uh, school. And I was uh, a friend of mine in high school had got me the job. And I remember it was our first few days of the job. And we painted some stuff low. And then we had to go up. And there was a two-story house. And at the top of the two-story house, there was a roof with dormers coming out. And we were going to paint the dormers. So the guy that I was working with, who's really good, he was a year older than me, he taught me, he showed me the ladder pick that you use, the scaffolding that goes across. He showed me how to put on the ladder jacks. So we would climb up, we would put the ladder jacks up, and then we would take this pick and put it up, the scaffolding, and set it on the ladder jack. And then you would climb up the ladder, and then you'd have to go out a little bit and get on the ladder jack. Now, I'll tell you something right now. I am not afraid of heights, but I am afraid of ladders. And I walked up there on this ladder, and I get up there trying to muster all the courage I have, and I start painting. And he's used to it. He's painting away, and I'm painting like this. I'm leaning in as far as I can. There's nothing to hold on to, right? And I'm painting like this, trying to do a good job. And he's talking. We're trying to have conversation. I'm trying to talk like nothing's happened, but, uh, but I was afraid. And after about three or four minutes, he, he said to me, Bill, are you, are you a little nervous? And uh, I said, yes. Now, a little nervous was an understatement. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm a little nervous. How do you know? And he said, you're shaking so much, you're shaking the scaffolding we were on. That's how nervous I was. I was scared to death. And what I had done, see, I had isolated myself. I was right next to him, but I didn't say to him, hey, I'm scared. I'm nervous because I didn't want to show any signs of being a weakness or anything like that. I isolated myself. You know, I look back in my life, and I think, I think this is even more so true with men. We all do it. But how many men isolate themselves when they're facing a tr problems? And I, uh, last night I asked, we did have a service last night, and I asked how many of the men here have really, you've been in fear the last year, and you haven't told anybody about it. And, Hardly anybody raised their hand. I said, that's okay. And, and somebody came up to me after the service, and he said, the reason I didn't raise my hand or the reason a lot of men didn't raise their hands is we were in fear, even admit we had been in fear. But we shouldn't be that way. And nobody has hardly ever come up to me. I can't remember it happening, a, a person coming up to me, especially a man, and saying, hey, Pastor Bill, I'm just afraid. You know, We don't do that. We don't have to put it that way, but I think it would be healthy if we would go and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm having a problem with this because isolation, as we see it happen to Elijah, that can happen to us. It's one of the enemy's uh, greatest enemies. So he puts himself in isolation. And uh, we're going to continue there. Say. So he went to Beersheba and Judah. He left his servant there. So he leaves his servant there. And now he's totally alone. Elijah is totally alone. He puts himself in isolation. He left a servant there while he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness. See, fear causes us fight or flight. Elijah flew away, didn't he? Causes flight. Fear causes isolation. And the third thing that fear causes is this, wandering in the wilderness. Now, the wilderness during this time, sometimes the Bible translates it into the desert. And it wasn't a wilderness filled with trees and, and things like that. We, when we think of the jungle or wilderness today or out in the woods, but the wilderness was a place where you had very few resources. The wilderness was a dry place. It wasn't a lot of activity or life. There was some, but not a lot of activity in the wilderness. And when fear causes us to go into the wilderness, you know, oftentimes the wilderness is not a, 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 a physical place but it's a state of mind. It's where we put ourselves in a position where we don't have the resources for help. We should never be that way. That's one of the reasons small groups are so important or sharing life with other people is so important. It keeps us not only out of isolation, but it also keeps us out of the wilderness. Well, we're going to continue the story. So we're told he left the servant there while he went a day's journey into the wilderness he came to a broom bush and sat under it and prayed that he might die. <laughs> he goes from defeating 450 prophets just a few days ago, and now he's praying, I wish I was dead. And listen to the prayer. He says, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, 
I am no better than my ancestors. I am no better than my ancestors. Then we're told this, he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. The next thing, the final fear, the thing that fear causes is for us to have these feelings of despair or feelings of defeat. Now, I didn't say we were defeated or, uh, no, we weren't defeated necessarily, but again, it causes these feelings of despair or defeat. And the definition of despair is a total lack of hope. And Elijah is not in a hopeless situation, but he thinks he is. And I look back on my life, and all the times I thought situations were hopeless. Many of those situations, almost all of them came to pass, and things were fine. But at the time, I thought I was in a hopeless situation. I'm thinking today in this world, we think that things are hopeless, but they're not. Uh, God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of Jesus Christ. He's the God of hope. And as long as we rely upon God, we have hope in this world. So now Elijah's asleep. What's going to happen next? Well, we need to praise God because he doesn't leave us alone in our despair or hopelessness. And Elijah is sleeping, and then we hear this, all at once. In other words, suddenly, all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals. Mm. Can you, did you ever smell freshly baked bread? Especially, can you imagine you're in the middle of the wilderness, you've given up all hope, you've got a little sleep now, and then there's fresh, fresh baked bread right next to you in water. So Elijah gets up, and he eats the bread and the water. We're told um, there was some uh, bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank. And then he lay down again. And I wonder how the angel touched him. He's asleep. And I imagine the angel didn't come up and smack him behind the head and wake up, although Elijah would have deserved this. I imagine that angel just walked up to him and just kind of put his hands on his shoulder and said, Elijah, wake up. Here's some bread for you. Well, then we hear this. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat. For the journey's too much for you. You need to get ready. You're going to go on this journey. And he wakes him up again. But I, I think we need to note here that the angel allows Elijah to sleep the second time. And, and sleep is important. I, we don't realize how important sleep is. And in, in, the, in, in a book called The Good and Beautiful of God, uh, the author James Bryan Smith, he writes a section called The, 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 uh, the Discipline of Sleep. And here's what he says, and, and I, I don't usually look at sleep this way, but we really need to. He says this, he says, the number one enemy of spiritual formation today is exhaustion. More people are killed by drowsy drivers than by drunk drivers. And, and then James Bryan Smith goes on and he says this, everything we do in our lives, including the practices of spiritual formation, we do in and with our bodies. If our bodies are not sufficiently rested, our energies will be diminished and our ability to pray, read the Bible, enter solitude, or memorize scripture will be minimized. Wow. Sleep is important. If you have a high schooler, parents, or somebody's out to college and they want to sleep in late on Saturday, I know it's kind of frustrating, but young children need sleep. We need sleep. They said in the 1800s, in the early 1800s, we got over nine, over nine hours of sleep. And now studies have shown that we're about seven to seven and a half hours of sleep. And the, the reality is we need more sleep than ever, and we simply don't, don't do it. And so here the, the, uh, the angel gives uh, Elijah, and God through the angel gives Eli Elijah the gift of sleep. Now, if you want to sleep in on Sunday mornings, we have a Saturday night service, or you can come to second service. But the truth, or we could go to bed earlier, but the truth of the matter is sleep's imp important in our life. Well, we continue in verse 8. We're told this. So he got up and he ate and drank. And strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And Horeb is the same mountain. It's sometimes it's called Mount Sinai. It's where Moses got the Ten Commandments. And uh, so he goes to this same mountain where Moses received these, these words from God, and we're told there he went into a cave and spent the night. 
And when you hear 40 days and 40 nights in the Bible, know this, God is coming. God is in between of it. God made it uh, rain for 40 days and 40 nights uh, during the great flood. Moses was on Mount Sinai interceding for that, in that same mountain for the people of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Jesus was tempted by the evil one, by Satan, for 40 days and 40 nights. So in the Bible, there's other examples of 40 days and 40 nights, but when 40 days or 40 nights is happening, God is going to be in it, and God's certainly in this. And then we're told this, and then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, when God asks a question, he already knows the answer, right? He knows everything. So when he says to Elijah, what are you doing here? What he's actually doing here is he's asking him, not for his own benefit, not for God's benefit, but for Elijah's benefit. And we're told he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah doesn't mention that he's just defeated through the working of God, 450 prophets of Baal. He forgets about this. And you can see the despair. Why has he forgotten about it? He is hopeless. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now, some experts, some scholars believe that the cave, the place where Elijah was hidden, is the same place that Moses was years before. Let me just read this to you. And I don't know if it was or not, but look at the similarities. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And he's speaking to God. And the Lord said, and this is from Exodus 33, 18. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness, goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see my face and live. Then the Lord said, this is a place, uh, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock. In other words, in a small cave, in a cleft of the rock, and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So when God is saying this, we see the similarities. He's talking to him and he's in a cleft in the rock or a clave, cave in the rock. And God now is going to reveal his glory to Elijah. So if repeating this, getting caught back up, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by, just like the Lord passed by in Moses' day. Then we hear this. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. So God sends such a powerful wind that rocks on the mountain begin to explode. But we hear this. But the Lord was not in the wind. In other words, the Lord's not going to speak to Elijah through the wind, but he had caused the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire. Fire. So the Lord sends an earthquake. He, he sends a wind to split apart rocks. And now he sends fire just like he had sent fire to defeat the prophets on Mount Baal to consume the 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 sacrifice that Elijah had. So when Lord, the Lord sends fire, this would have been in Elijah's wheelhouse. And he, could have, he would have remembered what the Lord's already done to him. But the Lord was not in the fire. And then we hear this. After, uh, um, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And see what God does. He, he, he shows these things and and we want to look at the second part. Okay, this is what, what fear causes us to do. Now we're going to look at how God conquers fear. And he conquers fear by telling us things, by showing us things. And the first thing that he basically has told Elijah is this. I'm still God. I can cause earthquakes. I can send wind that can split apart rocks. I can send fire from heaven just like I did uh, with the prophets that were on Baal. I am still God, Elijah. You're worried about things. You care about things. But, but I haven't changed I am still a God. And if we look at this in the, in the Old Testament, Testament, in the book of Malachi, uh, 
God says, I am the Lord and I do not change. Maybe your feelings about me change. Uh, maybe you've lost hopelessness and you change. But guess what? I am the same. And, and later on in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus echoes these same words. And Jesus says this in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't change. And so many times in the Old Testament, God is referred to as a rock. And when we think of rocks, you know, even big rocks, well, they can be moved by the bulldozers and things like that. And, uh, rocks can be moved. But in biblical times, if you had a big rock, you probably weren't ever going to move it. And when God is referred to as a rock in the Old Testament, it's saying this, he is not going to be moved by anything that we do as humans. He's steady and steadfast. He's always going to love and care for us. He doesn't change. We might change, but we have to know this. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're going through in the times in the United States and the world today, God is the same, and we need to hold on to that promise. So God doesn't change. So the first thing he says by doing all these things is, I am still God. And then we're told this. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Moving forward, after the fire came a gentle whisper. Gentle whisper. And the truth of the matter is this. God conquers fear by telling us, listen to my quiet voice. I'm still God. And you know, when things, when these, when things happen, miraculous things happen in, in a church, and we have those mountaintop experiences, I love those. And, and sometimes churches, and we're not, we're not indifferent, we talk about those experience when, experiences when those things happen. But so many times, so many times in my life, and, if, and I think in your life as well, when God moves and speaks, he does it in a still, in a quiet voice, in a gentle whisper. And God speaks to Elijah, not the, through these miraculous things that he had done, but through a gentle whisper. We always need to listen to God's quiet voice, his gentle whisper. You see, if we seek God only in the extraordinary, we miss him in the ordinary. Earthquake, extraordinary. Fire from heaven, extraordinary. Rocks splitting open because the wind's so severe is extraordinary. But God speaks to Elijah in this simple voice. Listen to me. Well, we're told this, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out, and he stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Does that sound familiar? Now God's asking him a second time. God reveals who he is. He's trying to get Elijah to snap out of it. And God, again, asking the same question, and again, not for God's benefit for Elijah's benefit. And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He says the exact same thing. He says the exact same thing, but God's not going to let him stay there. And now, now God starts to do it. Uh, God's going to bail him out of this. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. Elijah, you can't run away from your problem. Fight or flight, you've chose flight. You need to go back and face your problems. Go back the way you came. And I think God is saying go back physically, yeah, but go back spiritually. Go back emotionally. All hope is not lost. I am here. Don't despair. Go back and do what I intended you to do. Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Haziel, king of Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nishmi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Japhoth from Abu Mahala, to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Haziel. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. And I believe what God is saying when he says this, he's saying this. Go and do my will, my work. You know, you're so concerned about your own personal safety, you've kind of forgotten about me. Go do what I intend for you to do. 
And I've, I've noticed over the years that when we're working for God, God is working in us and for us. And, and the people that I've come in contact through over the years in churches and other places that are working hard, they're concentrating on God, they don't hear a lot of things because they know what they're supposed to do. And God tells Elijah, just do what you're supposed to do. I'll take care of the rest. I'll take care of the fear. Rely on me, follow me, and things are going to be okay. So that's what he tells him. Go do my will and my word. One more thing. God's got him now. He set him on a new path. Everything seems to be going well. And I love it because God adds a comment at the end. It just kind of wraps all things up to give total assurance to God. And God says this. He says, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Elijah, you're not alone. You were in despair. You ran. You thought you were alone. But guess what? There are 7,000 in Israel. And in the Bible, seven is, is, is the perfect number. And I believe what God is telling Elijah is this. I have the perfect amount of people still available. It's going to be okay. You are not alone. Not only am I with you, but you have people with you as well. And there it is. He basically says, hey, by the way, you're not alone. I know, I know I'm with you, which is good, but guess what? There are people just like you that love me, that want to follow me that are available. You just don't know who they are, but Elijah will help. We wrap things up this morning. Again, thanks for, for tuning into this. We appreciate it if you've watched it on the YouTube or whatever and on our website. Thank you so much for doing so. As we wrap things up, uh, Jess would be locked up here. Almost got through it. As we begin to wrap things up here, uh, uh, my question is this. What, what do you fear? I mean, may, part of it, sure, it may be the coronavirus, but in, in your life, what do you fear? Do you worry too much about the future of your children or, or maybe your marriage or if you're younger, you worry about if you're going to be popular in school or if you're going to go away to college, how you're going to do that, and you worry about losing your job. And look at all the uncertainty that's out here today. But Jesus is the same yesterday, day, and tomorrow, right? We need to continue to trust in God. Uh, what do you fear? And I love this verse from a Jeanette Wendell, and her parents were missionaries, and she was on that mission field for them for years, and she says this, safety is not the absence of danger, but the presence of God. Safety is not the absence of danger, but the presence of God. The truth of the matter is we need, our country needs, our world needs God today as much as, if not more, than ever. And finally, in 1 John verse 1, or 4, perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. And let me ask you this. Who or what is the embodiment of perfect love? Well, it's Jesus Christ who came into this world to suffer and die for our sins, to take our sins on his body on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He's given us victory over our sins. We need Jesus now more than ever. And having Jesus, we, we, don't, we still don't know what the future holds, do we? But we know who holds the future, and that's Jesus Christ. Hey, we are in certain times. We don't know what's going to happen. And I don't believe God sent this in the world or anything like that. I've heard some people say that. I don't believe that. And I believe this stuff happens, that all sickness and disease happens because we live in a fallen world. This ain't heaven. It's not a perfect place. But I believe good can come out of this. And I'd rather not have this than the good that comes out of it, that's for sure. But, but good can and will come out of this. And we can come out of this on the other side someday. Uh, this coronavirus uh, scare that we're facing and all that's going on, someday it's going to end. It might take a while and there might be some tough times ahead. But we just need to continue to trust in Jesus Christ, and he's the one who holds our future, and not go into despair. 
and do all we can to fight what's going on and just simply allow Jesus to be the rest. I'm going to pray for us as we close things out. Heavenly Father, I, uh, I thank you for Elijah, and I thank you for who he was, and we know he was imperfect, uh, but he served you a perfect God. So continue to be with us. Uh, to, uh, allow us to become the people uh, that you would have us be, and uh, allow us to reach out to people. So many people are hurting, and they need hope. And, and allow everybody that has the hope of Jesus Christ just to reach out to others, to, to, to reassure them, to be with them, to comfort them, to minister them as we enter these uncertain uh, times. And just be with us and allow us to continue, even in times like this, and especially in times like this, to allow us to be the people you would have us be. Amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. Next week, we're going to try again. We'll do the 608 service live. Uh, we're going to do the 915 live. We're going to do the 1045 live the next few weeks, and then we'll decide how we're going to get this message out to you in the future. Thanks for being with us today.